so good afternoon. My name is Karen Snedden. I'm interim dean and professor of law here at Mercer University School of Law, and I am delighted to welcome you to the third lecture of the Sheridan Lecture Series. The law school is so pleased to join with the School of Theology and the College of Liberal Arts to serve as a site for these very meaningful lectures that are being held at Mercer this year. We are so glad to be able to have this event in person. I think I can say for all of us, it's so nice to be in person. We've had really challenging and uncertain times, and we already knew it, but now we really have, I think, a deeper understanding about the importance of gathering together, the importance of learning from each other, and the importance of face-to-face -face conversation. I really want to thank the generosity of Walter and Kay, the support of the BJC, and the wisdom of our speaker, Reverend Dr. J. Augustine here. Um, I'm especially pleased to welcome Jay because, like me, he is a Tulane Law graduate, so I know that he's going to be a wonderful speaker. I'm going to apologize in advance because I have a scheduling conflict with a faculty meeting, so I will have to pop out and then pop back in. But last night, I was so delighted to have the opportunity to learn more about what is in store for you today. And Jay was so kind to have his book, so I know that it's going to be thoughtful and thought-provoking. Last night, I was also delighted to speak with and learn from Amanda Tyler, and I am really honored to be able to introduce her to you today. To many of you, she needs no introduction, but I'm going to brag on her because she is very awesome and deserves it. She's the executive director of the BJC in Washington, D.C., a graduate of Georgetown University and the University of Texas School of Law. She brings a lot of experience and different perspectives to this role. She leads the organization, as you know, as it upholds the historic Baptist principle of religious liberty, defending the free exercise of religion and protecting its establishment by the government. She is a frequent speaker in churches, educational institutions, and different types of gatherings. She provides a lot of commentary in the national media, and she is co-host of a podcast, which if you want to go ahead and download that, you are welcome to do so. It's Respecting Religious Series. I would say more about how to do that and then read your Twitter handle, Amanda, but I'm already maxed out at what I know on social media and podcasts, so I'll leave you to do that. She was, in 2019, named Baptist of the Year by EthicsDaily.com, and her work is really innovative and leading, and I was so pleased to have the chance to meet her. And so I will turn it over to Amanda. Thank you. Well, thank you so much, Jean Stedden, for that welcome and for hosting us at the law school and for being with us. Um, we really are in for a treat today. Uh, I, I think that our distinguished speaker has probably saved the best for last for this law school um, audience, so thank you for joining us. Um, it really is an honor and a pleasure to be back at Mercer University and Mercer Law School uh, for the 17th annual Walter B. and K.W. Sheridan Lectures on Religious Liberty and the Separation of Church and State. Um, as the Dean said, BJC is a coalition of individuals, churches, and more than a dozen different Baptist denominational bodies working together to educate about and advocate for everyone's faith freedom. And we don't just do this for our Baptist brothers and sisters, but also for Buddhists, Methodists and Muslims, Anglicans and atheists because a threat to anyone's religious freedom is a threat to everyone's religious freedom. Since 1936, we have headquartered our work on Capitol Hill in Washington, DC, but defending religious freedom for all takes place in communities across the country and on campuses just like this one. And so I hope if, um, whether today is your first introduction to BJC or you have been a supporter of BJC for many years, that you will keep in touch with us. And in your programs today, I did want to direct you, there are two QR codes in the program 
where you can sign up for email updates from BJC and stay connected with our work in that way. Also in your program on the back, you can see URLs for BJC, BJConline.org, as well as our social handle, which is at BJC on the Hill. And uh, I would encourage you, if you are on social media, to uh, please uh, go ahead and live tweet or otherwise comment on the lectures and use the hashtag Sheridan Lectures when you do so. I also want to recognize my colleagues from Washington and from our, D our BJC West office um, who have joined us for our lectures today. In the back is Charles Watson, Jr., BJC's Director of Education. And um, here is uh, Dan Hamill, BJC's Director of Strategic Partnerships. And of course, I want to thank, um, sitting right here in the front row, Buddy and Kay Sheridan, whose generosity and vision have brought these lectures to life over these past we're in the 17th annual, but it's actually our 18th year um, of doing these. And, and so thank you very much, very much for doing these. Um, so every third year, we come back to Mercer University um, to have these lectures. But in the other years, we travel around the country. Um, and this, these lectures are able to bring new perspectives to religious freedom and separation of church and state. Well, our distinguished lecturer this year is the Reverend Dr. J. Augustine, and you can read his impressive and distinguished biography in your programs, but I wanted to note a few highlights, um, which you can also see on this title um, slide here, the many different roles that Dr. Augustine um, plays. He is not only senior pastor of St. Joseph AME Church in Durham, North Carolina, but he's also a missional strategist at the Duke Center for Reconciliation and a law professor at North Carolina Central University. He's a native of New Orleans and has degrees from Howard University, Tulane Law School, United Theological Seminary, and Duke University. He's also recently published a new book, which is, called, which is titled Called to Reconciliation, How the Church Can Model Justice, Diversity, and Inclusion. And in these challenging days for our country and for religious freedom in particular, his multidisciplinary approach to problem solving is exactly the kind of approach that I think that we need. So BJC is so honored to partner with you in these lectures. Dr. Augustine, please help me in welcoming Dr. Augustine to the platform. My friends, what a pleasure and a joy to be with you. I'm going to take just a moment to make sure I don't have a wardrobe malfunction. I want my wardrobe to function, right? So I'm going to get mic'd up. I'm getting mic'd up because um, I am a, I'm a lawyer at heart and I'm in a law school. Praise God. I'm in a law school, said the pastor, right? And being in a law school in a space like this reminds me of trying cases to a jury. So I want to be able to move. I want to be able to talk and connect, right? So I appreciate that. I want to say thank you for the wonderful, warm welcome. Uh, thank you to this university's family. Thank you to BJC. Uh, specifically, I lift up Amanda, Charles, Dan. I'm so, so grateful to be a part of the BJC family now. Can a Methodist guy be a part of the BJC family? Yes, he can. Yes, he can. Yes, he can, right? So I'm so, so grateful for the warmth that you have shown me. Uh, I'm so grateful for this university, uh, uh, for President Underwood, uh, for Larry, his team, uh, uh, for the welcome that's been extended across the board, but I feel especially welcome here at the law school. Number one, let me just go to the aesthetics. I've been in a whole lot of law schools in my life. This place is beautiful. I am just so incredibly impressed, but to find out last night that I went to law school with this law school's dean, can you believe that is the word? Can you, so I just thank her so much. She had to, Karen had to run the faculty meeting, but I'm so, so thankful uh, to her. And, uh, and I also want to lift up as I have uh, the Sheridan family for your generosity, for your thoughtfulness, for your, forth uh, your forethought, uh, uh, for what you have done in terms of sowing a seed that will bear fruit for years and years and years to come. I am so grateful uh, to be a part of your family now uh, as a lecturer. Um, what I would like to do is share with you in a very interactive space. I am, I am not a preacher who, who looks for quiet from the congregation, nor am I a professor who asks the students to keep a finger over their lips. So I want you to be able to talk. I hope to set a space where you feel comfortable in talking and asking questions and interacting and all of the above. Is that okay? All right, so part of my plan for doing that is to move so I can be personable rather than being behind the podium. 
What I'd like to do is talk a little bit today. Uh, 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 this is the third lecture. The first lecture we looked from a at the at the School of Theology. We looked from a religious perspective at religious liberty and combating Christian nationalism. Uh, as I preach from the parable of the Good Samaritan, uh, the purpose of that, if you look at Luke 10, the purpose of that lecture, or that sermon, if you will, was to recognize that the God I serve uh, is not a God who castigates or a God who marginalizes. He's a God who embraces. Uh, and the parable of the Good Samaritan is about embracing the proverbial other, someone who is unlike you, to find community. That's really what America is all about. We're no longer a melting pot where people assimilate. Instead, America, for me, I'm from New Orleans, is about being a pot of gumbo, where everybody can identify the individuality of the ingredients, but they come together in something special that's community. That's really, really what America is supposed to be about. In the second lecture this morning, we lifted up history and attacking Christian nationalism and talking about what it is, showing the seeds that have been sown through various parts of American history, going all the way back to the colonial period and looking at how Puritan theology was planted, how a manifest destiny theology came about, how Christian nationalism came into existence as a result of some seeds that were sown, a back and forth pendulum of law and order politics, liberation politics, and how the church has played such a vital role going hand in hand uh, 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 with American progress and quite frankly with American regress. Now where are we? We're at a point I believe where I said last night I have to be optimistic. My name is Pollyanna, right? I have to be optimistic. I have to believe things can get better because in many regards they can't get any worse. We've come through some difficult times. But the main thing I'm challenged about and the main thing I want to challenge you about with this third lecture is the concept of democracy. And where are we in terms of citizen participation? We're in the law school. I want to focus my comments on the Voting Rights Act and where it is now, where it has been, and hopefully where it's going in the future. So the lecture I want to share with you is Making America Great Again? That's a question. Christian nationalism and recent attempts to undermine democracy. Much of what I will talk about has to do with my research, my writing as an interdisciplinary scholar. Um, the book on your left is one that was released last month. It's the work that Amanda referenced. I'm so thankful to her. She did one of the blurbs, one of the endorsements for the book. Um, uh, it is about reconciliation. I'm going to unpack some of it during the course of the lecture. The book on the right is about prophetic leadership, when prophets preach politics and leadership in the pulpit. Uh, a prophetic leadership, I'm going to talk about some of that in the, in the lecture, and in, 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 in when institutions cause social circumstances, or institutions have social circumstances that necessitate someone rising up to speak truth to, the, 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 the expression is speak truth to power, I like to say speak truth to institutions of power. For example, we are in Georgia. Can I say that again? We are in Georgia a state that has now some of the most uh, retrogressive, reprehensible, pick another R word to go along with it that says not good, uh, 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 attempts to undermine democracy in terms of who can vote, in terms of conditions for people to vote. Somebody's got to speak truth to institutions of power. That is what prophetic leadership is all about when it comes particularly from religious institutions. What I'm gonna do as an interdisciplinary scholar is talk a little bit about both of those schools of thought. Uh, 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 emanating from my work. If there is a central theme, if there is a thesis that I want to focus on during the course of this lecture, this third lecture, democracy is nothing more than an ideal for which we must fight. This treasured concept is under attack by Christian nationalists who are attempting to circumvent voting rights and unwrite, or some may say rewrite, American history. America needs, here's an action item, I believe this is necessary because of the example I just lifted up here in Georgia. America needs new national voter protection laws. By way of an outline, what I'd like to do, I want to review because the second lecture laid a historical foundation. I think some of those things are very important. I don't want to be redundant. I see several familiar faces. It's a blessing to have folks uh, to come more than once. 
but I want to review and hitting some of the highlights from history this morning uh, 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 and also talk about how religious freedom, I believe, is at the heart of democracy, how religious freedom has motivated individuals to go into citizen participation, motivated groups for citizen participation. I also want to talk about the significance of what happened in 2013 when the U.S. Supreme Court decided Shelby County v. Holder. If the Voting Rights Act, I believe it is, if the Voting Rights Act, or was, past tense, if the Voting Rights Act was the most measurable indication of success in the civil rights movement, legislation that allowed everyone to participate, theoretically at least, everyone to participate in the democratic process, then uh, what we have as a result of Shelby County v. Holder is an attempt to undermine citizen participation by leaving watchdog legislation on the books, uh, uh, giving it bark with absolutely no bite. And I'm going to talk in detail about what the Shelby County v. Holder decision means and why so many state legislatures, Georgia included, and now my new home state of North Carolina, have run amok in terms of circumventing democracy. We'll also talk about Christian nationalism in January 6th. Uh, if I were to, if I were to give a working concept of Christian nationalism, it's about maintaining power. It's about holding on and preserving the status quo. Uh, uh, it's about us versus them. Uh, uh, if 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 there is a concept that uh, we want to control, we in quotes want to control, and we don't want to lose control, that means there's no way our guy lost this election. He said he didn't lose the election. He said the votes were stolen. So we're going to preserve this country and by any means necessary, even if that means taking over the Capitol. We'll talk about really what that means. Stop the steal uh, of the narrative and more voter suppression laws, not just Georgia, not just Amanda's home state of Texas, uh, more voter suppression laws, Florida, and, uh, and questions and answers. I hope you have questions and I hope I have answers, right? <laughs> so I hope we have a good dialogue, okay? Is this fair? Are we all together? All right, good deal. So um, we touched on the concept of race or the concepts of race and religion in America. I believe they are absolutely connected from the origins uh, of this country. And I believe it's impossible to to decouple them. It's impossible to take them apart, especially from a historical perspective. Uh, many religious people believe this is the way God intended it to be. And when I say this is the way God intended it to be, I'm talking about the institution of chattel slavery. I'm talking not just about that literal institution, but I'm talking about a subjugation of certain groups based on race or based on ethnicity. Uh, some people believe this is the way God ordained things to be, and you can't tell them any differently, right? American exceptionalism emanated from the Revolutionary War, where we say we are different as a country. We've got God's providence on us. We are a chosen people, just like you read the Holy Bible, the people of Israel are chosen. Well, we in America are chosen too. Some people believe this, right? And you can't tell them any differently. So it influences how they act. And, and the concept of manifest destiny says that we are supposed to control the province of North America. We're supposed to set the tempo for the rest of the world. We're supposed to be the leading power. We are America. God put his hand on America. And this is the way America is supposed to be. This is the way America was set up. And any change, any attempt to change that is an attempt to work against God. So we've got to take you down. Do you understand that? You understand how troubling that concept of that thinking can be? That thinking is very, very real, though. Uh, so in other words, although the Declaration of Independence says, I love to quote this, we hold these truths to be self-evident that all people are created equal. Equal did not necessarily mean equal. Something very significant comes about. There obviously is the polarity of race in America. Race is a social construct. Race is nothing more than a socialization based on immutable characteristics. You look at me now and you say, hey, there's Jay, he's a black guy. So why don't you call me an orange guy? Why don't you call me a purple guy? Why don't you call me a blue guy, right? Because you have been socialized to say black, to say white, to say other, right? It's a social construct. So based on the social construction of race and how race is, or the delineation of race, there was subjugation in America, David Walker, who was a slave, who became an abolitionist, writes a provocative appeal. And David Walker's appeal in 1829 really calls Christianity to task by saying, this is hypocrisy. This is nonsense on stilts. So if there's anything, Christian Americans, how can you enslave others? Because this is the antithesis of what Christianity is supposed to be about. 
How can you profess freedom? How can you profess religious liberty? And how can you enslave others? His appeal also identified African-Americans as a deeply religious people with convictions and consciences. Now, I'm going to talk a moment about what that means. No group is monolithic. There's going to be divisions and distinctions in any, and I'm going to go for a moment to focus on the African-American community with at least two extreme examples, because that's the community that was the primary beneficiary of the Voting Rights Act, which is where I hope to go in a moment. In terms of the polarity of identifying religious liberty in the African-American community, after Walker's appeal, there really were two sides, if you will, that sprung up. There was the integrationist side. The most popular example of the integrationist side would be Martin Luther King Jr., someone who, from the prophetic leadership domain, attempted to integrate into society. And when I say integrate, I don't, I don't just mean that in the racial context, like integration in schools, but I mean that in the very literal context, as in full citizen participation. Does that make sense? The integrationalist perspective. There also, on the opposite side, was the nationalist slash separatist perspective. And the most popular embodiment of that was arguably Malcolm X in the Nation of Islam saying in so many words, uh, this country was not set up for us. Folks are not going to change. Folks are not going to embrace us. So we should have our own. We should have our own geographic boundaries. We should have our own this. We should have our own that. And everything should be separate. Two very schools of religious thought emanating, one from a Christian minister, the other from a, uh, from a Muslim minister. But all of this is part of religious liberty. I want to highlight the picture on the left of Dr. King just because of the chronology of when that picture was taken and, the, uh, and at least the calendar uh, a reference of where we are now. This is, this is the 30th, March the 30th, which means it's almost April, and that picture was taken on April the 4th, 1967, at the Riverside Church in New York, exactly one year before his assassination. We're coming up on the anniversary, Monday, if I'm not mistaken, is the anniversary of uh, Dr. King's very untimely assassination in 1968. But that picture was taken as part of his protest, the way, protest against the way uh, 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 soldiers were being, uh, uh, African-American soldiers in particular, poor soldiers, minority soldiers, were being sent to Vietnam uh, and all of the politics behind Vietnam and so forth. But nonetheless, King was one who wanted integration, full citizen integration. That obviously means the right to vote. Um, inauguration day in 1953, in the midst of everything that was going on in the black community, the divisions between separatism and inclusion or integrationalism in the, in the mainstream community, uh, uh, we moved and, and we elected uh, a general to run the country. Uh, uh, Dwight David Eisenhower in 1953 raises his hand. You see a picture of him there with Billy Graham. He raises his hand, and when he puts his hand on the Bible, the other hand on the Bible to take his oath of office, the Bible is open to 2 Chronicles, a popular passage of Scripture. If my people will just bow and pray, if my people will just humble themselves before me, right? So Eisenhower's administration starts a real, in the 20th century, a real conflation of church and state. Much against, we're not going to unpack all of the things we talked about earlier, but unlike looking at the origins of our country uh, 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 at, the, at the colonial period, we were very deliberate in looking at all of the back and forth that occurred in England and saying, we don't want a conflated church and state in America. We want things to be very separate in America. But here we have a president who reaches to the popularity of people's hearts and is bringing religion front and center where things start to conflate. Uh, there's, a, there's a manifest destiny in Christian nationalism that start to come together uh, under, a, under a guise of civil religion where we say under God is added then to the Pledge of Allegiance. Some of you all are young enough. You thought it was always there. Tell the truth, don't you? OK. It was added to the Pledge of Allegiance in 54 and in God we trust was added to our currency in 1955. These are very deliberate and strategic efforts to say America is chosen. The hand of God is on us and we're different from everyone else. So what we are doing to maintain order in America, I'm doing this in air quotes, to maintain order in America shows that we have God's province and God's favor. Does that make sense? I'm only saying this is one, I'm not saying correct. This is one school of thought. Let me, this is one school of thought. Okay. In addition to that school of thought, there's another school of thought too. 
There's the school of thought of the integrationists again that says, we do hold these truths to be self-evident that all people are created equal. And we've got to do some things to make sure equal does in fact mean equal. The civil rights movement comes about, and as I shared this morning, I have written law review articles to reference, uh, and a book called A Reconciliation to reference different origins, different scholars attribute different things as the genesis of the civil rights movement. Some would say it was the Supreme Court's decision uh, ending or overturning a, a, a Plessy v. Ferguson, the Brown v. Board of Education decision, May the 17th, 1954. Others would say it was the onset of the Montgomery bus boycott from December 1st, 1955. Either way you slice it, here's the common point. It comes from religious liberty. It comes from the free exercise of what we believe as prophetic leaders in the black church here, because the picture on the left shows Pastor Brown, Oliver Brown, who was a pastor at St. Mark's AME Church in Topeka, Kansas. And he filed suit, led a, led a group of plaintiffs in filing suit on behalf of his daughter. Uh, uh, there were five cases that were consolidated together that went before the Supreme Court when it ruled as it, as it did, rather, on March the 17th, 1954. On the, on the right, you see a reflection of, that's a 26-year-old Dr. King, right? Um, this, is a, this is the prophetic witness of civil disobedience. And the civil disobedience that he shows, I want to be clear and, and, and underscore the religious reference here, the civil disobedience that Dr. King showed and exemplified with the, and Rosa Parks for that matter, with, with disobeying the laws of the land at that time, was not a Henry David Thoreau civil disobedience. It was a Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. It was very much a Daniel three civil disobedience, the three Hebrew boys, because as Dr. King wrote years later in a letter from Birmingham jail, uh, 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 an unjust law is no law at all. Um, a, a threat to injustice, a threat to justice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere. So there was a very compelling reason from his faith why he stepped out front in leading this movement. Are we together? I just always have to ask. I'm accustomed to Sunday mornings. They talk back to me at church. And I just have to ask. Okay, I just have to ask if we together. Okay. All right. I'm not going to quit my day job, but this is my attempt at comedy also. So feel free to, to participate in comedy hour. Okay. All right. I want to I want to underscore some of the theology here. I'm going to get to the law in a moment, but I think it's I, I, I can't I can't emphasize enough the, the connectedness of how the two go together for me, at least from my perspective, and how scripture has influenced social movements and how social movements have influenced law or law changes here from a from a theological perspective, from a Christian ethics perspective. Uh, there is the imagery of the Christian cross, and I want to use that to talk about reconciliation. And particularly, I'm going to get to a term called civil reconciliation, which I write about in the book Call to Reconciliation. That's really what we see King doing, and that's really the religious conviction that is unpacking or, or, or underscoring his work in the movement. In his first book, Stride Toward Freedom, the Montgomery story, King wrote about the vertical plane of the cross and also about the horizontal plane of the cross. The vertical plan of the cross is salvific. It represents, from a Christocentric perspective, human salvation, because it says humans were saved and reconciled in their relationship to God through Jesus. So that means Jesus died so we could all live. But guess what? Jesus also lived. And Jesus lived a life as an exemplar of equality for all people. So that means we are equal to one another because of Jesus. So those would give the concepts of salvific reconciliation and social reconciliation, right? King also often argued that the church should never be so heavenly holy that she can be no earthly good, right? So let's not get so caught up in piety where we forget our social convictions of equality here on earth. So. So, civil, excuse me, so uh, salvific reconciliation and social reconciliation lead directly to a concept I'm going to unpack called civil reconciliation, and that is the prophetic edge of speaking truth to power. So with the two planes, if you will, of the cross, 
The fight for voting rights, full citizen participation I talked about, the fight for voting rights is rooted in that threefold reconciliation paradigm or that threefold theology of salvific, social, and civil. Remember, salvific reconciliation says humans are reconciled in their relationship with God through Jesus. Through Jesus' suffering, humanity is saved. Social reconciliation says humans are reconciled to one another. We are equal because of Jesus. Black, white, Jew, Gentile, Protestant, and Catholic. Have y'all heard that quote somewhere before? You've heard that somewhere before. That wasn't me. That was Dr. You've heard that. Okay, my point being all humans are reconciled to one another socially because of Jesus. And then civil reconciliation is what we saw through the civil rights movement. Civil reconciliation was that exercise in religious liberty. It's a cousin, if not a sibling, of social reconciliation because it demands equality through prophetic activism. Does that make sense? Well, I'm afraid I'm losing y'all. Did everybody have a heavy lunch? Is that what's going on? Okay, I just want to make sure we're together. All right, thank you. What does it look like? What does civil reconciliation look like? What is a willingness to sacrifice of oneself, emulating the suffering of Christ? What does it look like as we get to full citizen participation? It looks like young people sitting in at lunch counters in 1960 in Greensboro, North Carolina, putting themselves, putting their physical bodies at issue. It looks like young people, 20 something year olds, uh, uh, signing their wills, going to see Lawyers who are volunteering of their time because they're getting ready to test uh, 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 discrimination in interstate commerce through the Freedom Rides in 1961, knowing that those buses that they're riding on would be firebombed, not might be firebombed, would be firebombed. Isn't that amazing? Isn't that a, a strong religious conviction to put yourself fully on the line for a great principle that you believe in, that you believe in freedom and full equality for all people? This is religious liberty or the free exercise. It looks like Bloody Sunday. It looks like John Lewis, a member of the clergy who went on to serve in Congress. It looks like sacrificial suffering where his skull literally was cracked in on March the 7th, 1965 in Selma, Alabama, as he attempted to cross the Edmund Pettus Bridge. Going to the hospital, but the redemption came not long thereafter when Lyndon Baines Johnson signed the Voting Rights Act into law. So if there is any empirical measure that says the civil rights movement, all of the stuff I just highlighted was successful, it's passage of the Voting Rights Act and full citizen participation. Does that make sense? I'm getting ready to shift the paradigm. Actions, I'm physically moving to show I'm shifting, but I had to walk in front of you to shift, I'm sorry. Actions have reactions. The reaction to the quote unquote lawlessness of the civil rights movement was a law and order campaign by Richard Nixon. Nixon started to sow seeds of division uh, 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 there with Jimmy Graham campaigning, of course. He started to sow seeds of division with the Southern strategy. As those people, who are those people? Those people are starting to move into our cities because of these new laws that allow them to, to come in where they want to come in. Those people are voting, those people, those people, drawing division and polarity as groups are seeking full citizen participation. The seeds of this Southern strategy really started to materialize. Uh, uh, we're in the law school, right? The seeds of the Southern strategy started to materialize, but Nixon had to leave office. Y'all know Nixon had to leave office, right? Well, I'm not a crook. Okay, Nixon had to leave office, but after Nixon left office, the 1980 presidential campaign, uh, 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 Ronald Reagan really sows, really weds with the evangelicals, really weds with very conservative white evangelicals behind the leadership of Jerry Falwell, the very deliberate, manipulative leadership, if you will, of Jerry Falwell. Uh, and Reagan gives the famous quote during the campaign, I know you can't endorse me, but I sure do endorse you. His charisma unified for 40 years a solid, empirically predictable block of voters for Republican Party candidates. I don't care what the platform said, I don't care what, all behind the issue of Roe v. Wade, which was a made up issue nonetheless though, but that's another lecture for another day. But nonetheless though, a solid block of voters for Republican Party candidates. Uh, uh, the, the, 
The glass didn't break, if you will, until all of the transgressions of the incumbent then running in 2020, where people started to say, wait a minute, have we been had? <laughs> have we been hoodwinked? Have we been bamboozled or led astray, right? So I think we're seeing now a, um, a reckoning, in the true sense of the word, a, a, a settling of accounts and a realignment of where evangelicals are, moving perhaps back to where they were, rather than in the political domain, so, so united with one party. But this is where it began. When the prophet speaks truth to power, exercising a dream of equality, Christian nationalism rises up and says, we want to preserve power. You're attempting to speak truth to power? We are power. This is the institution of power, and we want to hold on to it. So we're going to take a stance for God, because God doesn't want this lawlessness in God's country. We've seen this manifest up. This is an image from the Roy Moore campaign down in Alabama, his Senate campaign. And you may remember Roy Moore was chief justice of the Alabama Supreme Court. And he just saw such a unification of church and state where he says, no, we've got to have the Ten Commandments in every governmental building. But uh, with separation church and state, and doggone separation church and state, we want it in every building. So some people have a very conflated ideology, but this, this demographic rises up, and you have to respect that. They rise up. The conflation of Christian nationalism and white evangelicalism. Again, I made reference before that white evangelicals largely, I believe, have been manipulated by the issue of Roe v. Wade. There's, there's no doubt in my mind about that uh, with an intent to overturn Roe v. Wade. Uh, now, this, this, this lens through which we look at God and country together, where, where they go hand in hand, cross and country are completely conflated together. This is about the preservation of power. That's all Christian nationalism is. It's not, a, it's not a theology. It's not an orthodoxy. It is about the preservation of power. And you see it manifest in different ways. Actions have reactions. Again, the action in the 1960s of Dr. King speaking truth to power, the quote unquote lawlessness, gave a white lash, as I call it, uh, uh, with respect to the Southern strategy and the, and the sowing of seeds in Nixon and yada, yada, yada. The white lash in response to President Obama was, let's make America great again. So the real question I'm raising for you is, are we making America great by leading through some of the policies? 2013, Obama's administration, Obama was elected in 2008, uh, uh, left office after the 2016 election, so eight years. I like to call him no drama, Barack Obama. No drama, no scandal, no nothing. No, no drama, Barack Obama. But during his eight years in office, the Supreme Court hit Shelby County. I want to play lawyer for a moment and talk about what the Shelby County case really, really did. Um, it gave the most significant blow that the Voting Rights Act has sustained. The Voting Rights Act has two main provisions. They're still both intact. They haven't been touched. Sections two and five. Here's the unpacking. Section two of the Voting Rights Act, which is still on the books, which is still used from time to time, section two prohibits discrimination or discriminatory procedures based on race, language, or minority status. So if you really have a problem with what someone has done in, in changing a procedure to vote, you think this is discriminatory, you think this is out of bounds, this is beyond the pale, section two gives you the right to go file suit. It's America. Yes, you can. You know the problem, though? The litigation process is slower than a turtle. Suits are heard way down the line, but elections come up pretty quickly, right? So section two really, really is of no consequence when you're trying to enjoin someone uh, uh, in a very short term uh, uh, with, a, with a change or pack, practice and procedure for an upcoming election. Section five of the Voting Rights Act now relates to a, 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 a preclearance for what are called covered jurisdictions. If you're going to make changes to voting practices and procedures, if you're going to change the hours uh, uh, that polls, uh, poll locations are going to be operated or open, if you are going to uh, move away drop boxes, if you're going to close satellite voting locations, if you're going to change early voting, because covered jurisdictions have such a history of, the law professor would say, invidious practices in voting, uh, invidious practices, you, um, uh, you have to have preclearance. What is preclearance? You can get it in one of two ways, administrative or judicial. 
administrative preclearance. I've done it before. It's sending a letter to the Department of Justice asking them to look into X, Y, and Z, blah, 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 blah. They will administratively investigate. Uh, uh, the alternative way, judicial preclearance is literally filing what the lawyers would call a deck action, a petition or a complaint for declaratory judgment with uh, uh, the district court in D.C. for them to make a declaration of what the, what the uh, in, in infraction is, alleged infraction is. Now, what is a covered jurisdiction? I'm so glad you asked. <laughs> um, covered jurisdictions are, 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 and this is, this is, let me unpack from a 14th Amendment perspective uh, in terms of the Equal Protection Clause. If you really think about a definition of what discrimination is, uh, when, I, when I've taught constitutional law in the past, I like to use the example, discrimination is not always bad. Discrimination is inevitable because we all engage in discrimination, right? I'm wearing a gray suit today. I have more than one gray suit. I have, this is a solid gray. I have gray with gray pinstripes. I have gray with checks, gray tone on tone. I have a couple of different grays, right? I hang all my grays together in the closet. I hang all my blues together in the closet. I hang my browns, my blacks. I hang them all together in the closet. And when I go in the closet and I decide I'm feeling this kind of gray today and not that kind of gray today, I'm engaging technically in an act of discrimination because I am treating things that are similarly situated differently. I'm showing a preference to one over the other. Does that make sense? Okay, so discrimination is not always a bad thing. So, so the Voting Rights Act technically discriminates in that it shows certain places are covered by our purview, other places need not be covered by our purview. And the reason for that discrimination is because of the history of disenfranchisement in those particular places. Does that make sense? Let me give you an example of what I mean. This is a true story. Last night, as we were having dinner, we were talking about me being from New Orleans, Louisiana, the time you all spent in Louisiana, natives of Mississippi. I said something about my first church in a place, a little small place, called Tangibahoa Parish. Buddy said to me last night, true story, you know what they call Tangibahoa, don't you? I said, I'm from there. They call it Bloody Tangibahoa. He said, that's right, Bloody Tangibahoa. Why do you think they call it Bloody Tangibahoa? Do you think Bloody Tangibahoa is a place where they wanted everybody to come vote freely? It's a, it's a covered jurisdiction is the point I'm trying to make, right? Um, um, places that have history of raising questions like, how many bubbles in a bar of soap? Those are covered jurisdictions. So when you think geographically, you don't have to pull out a map. The South shall rise again. The South is largely the areas here covered jurisdictions. Hence, the Shelby County decision came from Alabama, or the, the, the uh, plaintiff came from Alabama. But my point being, with certain covered jurisdictions, uh, 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 they, they fall within the purview of the Voting Rights Act because of their history and discrimination. Now, here is the catch. Section 4 of the Voting Rights Act. Nobody ever heard about Section 4 of the Voting Rights Act. Section 4B gives a coverage formula which determines which jurisdictions are covered, who's had history, who's had problems in the past, so forth and so on. The Supreme Court says, You've had Barack Obama, no drama Obama as a president. Guess what? Prejudice is over. Racism is gone. We're going to clear. This coverage data is clearly outdated. This is discriminatory on its face. You're done. So we declare Section 4 be unconstitutional while leaving the remainder of the Voting Rights Act intact. Did you just catch that? It's a dog who has barked with no bite. The Voting Rights Act is still on the books but it might as well not be on the books. This is why, this is why you have so many state legislatures that are doing what those covered jurisdictions have always wanted to do. Case in point, North Carolina. This is a picture I'm proud to display, uh, uh, arguably the most profound prophetic leader of our time is, uh, is the Reverend Dr. William J. Barber II. Uh, uh, that's that's this, you can see it's obviously during the pandemic. This is yours truly in the background. He's preaching at St. Joseph Church, where I'm happy to serve as the pastor. Where I'm blessed to serve as the pastor, and that was uh, that was during the course of the pandemic, obviously. Um, uh, Reverend Barber's leadership, or Dr. Barber's leadership, really, really came up in the wake of Shelby County. I mentioned the book on prophetic leadership. The fundamental assertion is that social circumstances create prophetic leaders. Prophetic leaders rise up as a result of their circumstances. 
In the wake of Shelby County, the North Carolina General Assembly gerrymandered districts and passed voter suppression laws that the state that that, that the uh, uh, U.S. Fourth Circuit Court of Appeal ruled unconstitutional as quote unquote targeting African Americans with surgical precision. Dr. Barber was president of the NAACP at the time the suit was filed against former Governor McCrory. Uh, it went through the litigation process up to the U.S. Court of Appeals for the Fourth Circuit. Their opinion, uh, uh, not my own, uh, but, if, but the fact remains. Uh, the, the litigation was about uh, um, voter ID laws. I want to unpack for just a moment what voter suppression looks like. It sounds so incomprehensible, like how can a law suppress the right to vote? Everybody has the right to vote. Sounds that way, right? Sounds good in theory. Um, when laws make it more onerous, for one group to vote than another, when you do demographic studies to find out who has certain types of ID and who doesn't, and then the lawmakers decide, hmm, well, guess what? African Americans, according to this report, don't have these types of IDs. We're gonna leave those off the acceptable ID list, and we're gonna put these others on the acceptable ID list. And all they'll have to do is go and get a, uh, and go get a driver's license, get a state driver's license, get some other form of state ID. But wait a minute, that means this demographic we're looking at is largely waged employees and not salaried employees. So you're saying they're going to have to take off work and, and go get the IDs? Essentially, you're paying a poll tax in order to register, in order to, to get the appropriate requirements, the uh, uh, photo IDs to vote. That's one example. That's one example of how state legislatures are rising up with, quote unquote, states' rights which was code word for a whole bunch of other stuff that we thought was gone in yesteryear, but, but legislatures are rising up with states' rights as an attempt to disenfranchise and marginalize the impact of certain demographics in the, in the process of voting. Are we all together? Did I lose you all? Everybody together? Okay, just wanna make sure we're together, all right. Um, let's think about what a post-Obama presidency gave us, or as we were approaching the end of of Obama's term, second term. We had campaign rhetoric that Mexicans were rapists and murderers. This is identity politics and manifest destiny at its best, right? We had an executive order known as a Muslim travel ban, which was litigated in the case uh, Trump v. Hawaii, Hawaii v. Trump, what have you, um, uh, but, a, but, a, but a deliberate attempt to target, and this plays in politically Christian nationalism too, it plays in politically um, to say that I'm going to get tough on those Muslims, I'm going to get tough on this particular demographic, I'm going to get tough on these folks, and, and, and targeting certain countries because of the demographics of, of religious observers in those countries, right? The Muslim travel ban is what the case was called. When you start separating migrant children from their families at the U.S.-Mexico border, and then the Attorney General of the United States of America, who happened to be a United Methodist Sunday School teacher, comes and tries to justify the action by citing Romans 13. Can I stop you for a second? That's the same scripture that was used to justify slavery. Hello. You had the incumbent calling uh, 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 Haitians, and African people from Haiti and African nations saying that they come from you know what whole countries. This is the post Obama world that we found ourselves in. Now, I have attempted to share that there's been a connection between law and religion, and, and in many times, law is responsive to social movements that are started by religious actors. During the presidency of Barack Obama, here's my honest assessment. During the presidency of Barack Obama, from an African-American perspective, it was wonderful to see President Obama in office. Yes, it was. It was wonderful to see a well-educated family man, someone who loved his family, supported values, so forth. It was wonderful to see that. But I also recognized that it had a very, shall I call it, satiating effect. It had a very, shall I call it, inebriating effect. Uh, uh, meaning there's so many others who would have been freedom fighters, but the church started to... <sighs> Are y'all going to sleep on me in here? <laughs> what are we fighting about? Barack Obama's in office. There's no reason to fight. Just turn on the news. Happy days are here again. Right? The church went to sleep is what I'm trying to say. The church really lost its prophetic focus for a few years, and the church went to sleep. 
The pictures you see here are, are a reflection that the Make America Great Again movement remobilized the church and we, we got out of Rip Van Winkle State, the church woke up. The pictures are from a rally, I personally took these pictures, a rally that I attended outside uh, at Lafayette Park, uh, uh, right opposite St. John's Church uh, uh, in D.C. Um, uh, on the left, uh, Bishop Reginald Jackson, in deference to him from the AME Church, a call to consciousness. Uh, uh, we, are, we are here in Georgia, he's the AME Bishop of Georgia. Um, uh, and on the right, that's Bishop Jackson again speaking at Metropolitan AME Church, uh, which is in D.C. Now around Bishop Jackson, on the, behind him, the picture on the left there, those are ecumenical and interfaith leaders from all sorts of stripes. I mean, everybody's included there. Everybody's represented because this was a response to what was uniformly seen almost as reprehensible from the incumbent in the office at, in, in the presidency at that time. The question is, does it take all of that? Does it, apparently it did because the church went to sleep, but does it take all of that? Does it take a full frontal assault to democracy and to values to, uh, uh, to mobilize uh, 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 faith leaders? Here's a quick recap of what I just talked about. Christian nationalism with the politics of us versus them says family separations at the U.S. border. It is the Trump v. Hawaii case, the Muslim travel ban case. In North Carolina, in the wake of Shelby County v. Holder, it meant voter ID laws that were very, very onerous and again, as the Fourth Circuit ruled, targeted at African Americans with surgical precision. The law was House Bill 589 from that legislative session. Uh, uh, Shelby County v. Holder essentially gutted the Voting Rights Act in the most, in the most unpredictable way, striking away Section 4B, the Section 4B coverage formula, but leaving the act itself intact. In a post-2020 election America, voter suppression legislation now is legion. Almost every state, this is where we're going with the next few slides, almost every state is wrestling with laws that make it harder and more onerous for people to vote because the powers that be, those that are attempting to preserve power, don't ever, ever, ever want as many people who voted in 2020 to vote in mass again. The worst states, I would argue, uh, uh, are Texas and here in Georgia, some of the most reprehensible uh, backward steps in, in citizen democracy that you ever want to see. All right. If Christian nationalism is anything, it's not about theology. It's not about church orthodoxy. Christian nationalism is about power. It's about preserving the status quo. What does that look like? It looks like the picture on the left taken January 6th. In God we trust, stop the steal. How do we get that together? It looks like the picture on the right carrying a flag outside the Capitol. Jesus is my savior, Trump is my president. How do we put that together? I respect you for either one, but when you start to conflate them, I'm like, okay, can we have a conversation? How do we get to that point where those two are so closely wedded? So to preserve power, Christian nationalism is destroying democracy. It, is, it was on full display for the January 6th insurrection. Again, we've talked about voter suppression laws popping up in multiple jurisdictions. I'm gonna show some graphics in a moment. It is, it is redistricting that's going on in state legislatures. That's the real battle. First of all, redistricting that occurs after the census. Did we really have good census data? Do we know? Who didn't we want to count in the census? There's so many people, we can't count all of those people. No, we can't. It was an incredibly flawed process that was not transparent at all. And we're having fights. Fights are still going on regarding redistricting and attempts to unwrite, I like to say unwrite, not just rewrite, but unwrite black history with a, with a wedge issue called critical race theory that has, as the expression goes, absolutely nothing to do with the price of tea in China. It has nothing to do that's relevant with anything. Critical race theory is something I studied in law school, in law school, in law school. It's not something that's being studied usually on undergraduate campuses, and it's certainly not something that's being studied at the secondary, middle, or elementary school level. It's just not. But it is such a wedge issue, we want to throw it out there to say, we're for America and they're against America. Christian nationalism. All right. What does this lens of Christian nationalism look like? It looks like undermining democracy by saying we don't want citizen participation. Your story, your legacy of the Holocaust, that didn't happen. Take those books off the shelf. Ban those books. We're voting. We're voting you out of here. Get those books out of this library. Get those books out of this school. We don't want anybody to read about that stuff. Shh. Boy, y'all a tough crowd. Y'all a tough crowd. I tell you, I'm keeping my day job. 
I'm going to ask these. Okay. Christian nationalism, again, the ban on critical race theory is an attempt to unwrite history because we've got to tell his story more so than history. Does that make sense? Now, um, uh, it requires a prophetic response. Christian nationalism, I believe, requires a prophetic response from the church. I believe it also requires a legal response from those who have legal training and those who care about the law. Nearly half of the voters in this survey, the graphic on your left, think that Christian nationalism is a threat. I heard Amanda last night at dinner say exactly what's in my mind, and I'm going to repeat it now. I think Christian nationalism is the biggest threat to democracy that we know today. I truly believe it. And most of the voters from this poll feel the exact same way. Christian nationalism is a political ideology, again, that, create, that conflates rather across and country to maintain the status quo. It's not about acceptance. It's not about inclusion. It's about the politics of us. This is our defined identity camp. This is our tribe. To use the word, this is our tribalism. This is our tribe. And if you're not in it, you're against us and we're taking you down. If anything is against it, the status quo, then this must be against God. So people who are, see, uh, who are seeking to exercise their rights are going against God's will for America. Meaning all of you folks out there protesting, talking about Black Lives Matter, how dare you? This is God's country. You're against God's will. You're bad. All of you all that are seeking the right to vote, how dare you try to push the needle that way because this is not what God intended for this country. Do you understand this conflation I'm trying to describe? Is this making sense? Because it seeks to maintain, quote unquote, God's order, immigrants, minorities, and our Jewish brothers and sisters become problems. But in the politically correct world in which we live now, we can't exactly say they're a problem. So what do we do? We try to pass laws targeted at them. We try to remove their books from libraries. We try to erase the problem. This is what we're seeing, attempts to undermine democracy. Christian nationalism is not the only problem. Lord knows America has a whole bunch of problems, but it is a lens through which other problems can be viewed and understand how to address them. Christian nationalism really is a lens in looking at larger issues in America. Now, in the wake of what I believe was a free and fair election, in the wake of what, what people who supported the losing incumbent said, they said, I supported him. I'm the Secretary of State in Georgia. And I found no evidence whatsoever that says that I, I just, I, I, I admit I supported him, but I hadn't found anything he said to be true, right? In the midst of multiple states like that, right? In the midst of that, uh, uh, many states, the graphic on your left, are moving to restrict voting in ways like never before. They're filing bills that would alleviate drop boxes. We, we, in other words, we took extraordinary precautions because of safety reasons in 2020 to make sure people could vote in multiple ways. We went out of our way to make sure democracy means democracy and everybody could participate. I said, my goodness gracious, look at this. This is America. I love America. In the wake of stop the steal, stop the steal. There's no evidence to say anything was stolen. It was stolen from me. It was stolen from me. It was stolen from me. You can say it four times. It doesn't mean it was stolen, right? Okay, so in the wake of Stop the Steal stuff, we're seeing laws passed in legislatures where, where it's an attempt to preserve power, it's a conflation of ideology and going with political will and people worrying about who's gonna come at me in the primary. It's a crazy system and people are rolling into the craziness. In most states, lawmakers are filing bills to pull voting in the opposite direction. Again, to make sure there is as limited citizen participation as possible. And I think that is incredibly sad in the United States of America. If I didn't share this with you before, I'm a proud veteran. I spent time here in Georgia before extended time because I was hurt in Ranger School at Fort Benning, Georgia. Uh, uh, but I went to jump school at Fort Benning, Georgia. I'm a former infantry officer in the United States Army. So if anybody has the right to call America to the task, guess who does? 
Now, um, uh, that again is on the right is Bishop Jackson. I'm giving special deference to him uh, because I'm in Georgia. This is his home jurisdiction, right? This is where he serves as the AME Bishop of Georgia. And that obviously, you know the state capitol better than I do, right? That, but that's, that's, uh, that's obviously outside the Georgia capitol. Um, this, was, this was a protest rally that he led uh, after some of the new Georgia laws that restrict voting access uh, uh, either were introduced or passed or what have you, but at some point in the, in the uh, legislative adopting process. Uh, uh, Georgia limiting the use of ballot drop boxes, imposing new ID requirements for absentee voting, uh, allowing state officials to take over local election boards. What did you say? <laughs> what did you just say? So, so uh, making it a crime to give food or drinks to voters in line. My goodness gracious, did I say Georgia has some of the most reprehensible stuff? We are in Georgia. Georgia, on oh my mind. I'm not gonna try to sing. But anyway, my point being, um, uh, I, think this is, I think this is really reprehensible. It's a threat to democracy as we know it, and why would you not want a majority to rule? Why would you not want that? What's so bad about having people's voices heard? After all, we hold these truths to be self-evident that all people are created equal, but that's not at all what we're seeing. So if people are gonna be engaged, they should be engaged. The block on the right, the image on the right, I worked for a season as, um, as of counsel uh, with an organization called the Southern Coalition for Social Justice. I'm so proud of the work that organization does and I absolutely, I mean, they're really wonderful. They're headquartered in North Carolina, but they, but they work throughout the Southern region. Allison Riggs, who's head of the, uh, of the, of the litigation, the voting rights team, uh, shared this quote. Make no mistake, these legal scare tactics aimed at Caswell County are meant to undermine the promise of the Voting Rights Act, reduce local representation for communities of color, and turn back the clock on voting rights in North Carolina. If there's any connection I want you to make is that the turn back the clock, the retrogression, these things only came about as a result of Shelby County v. Holder. You follow what I'm saying? I'm in the law school, that's why I'm focusing on the Voting Rights Act. So my questions here, not necessarily rhetorical, because remember, I welcome audience participation, right? My questions here, what about you? What about you testifying in committee when laws are going through your General Assembly or your state legislature? When's the last time you trucked it on down Atlanta to go testify when a bill was being heard? It's important, the appellate Argue, the appellate advocate in me always remembers when the case is tried, make the record, make your objection, make the record is the point I'm making, right? This is part of record making in the legislative process. Have you considered partnering with others, for example, faith leaders, have you considered partnering with them to file suits that challenge voter suppression laws? Some of them you may win, some of them you may not. But even if you lose in the court of law, I think you win in the court of public opinion, right? Have you considered stepping out, taking a bold step to do something to, to empower others and to call out a problem? Have you been engaged in redistricting? I think, I haven't been kept following everything as closely as I should. Alabama still had redistricting litigation going on at least a week ago, two weeks ago maybe. North Carolina, I know, was a huge victory in one regard. Uh, regarding uh, congressional seats. This was about two weeks ago, three weeks ago, um, uh, with the Southern Coalition for Social Justice leading the right there, leading the fight in North Carolina. I'm, I'm not sure how many other states, but the whole, you know, the reapportionment or redistricting process has been so incredibly politicized with gerrymandering, but it's all about control and how we maintain control. But, but have you been engaged? Are you willing to partner with somebody to file suit? Is that important enough to you, right? I'm in the law school. I'm hoping to have some, some talented law students here, as well as perhaps some professors who say, sure, you know, I've got a bar card in my pocket that I'm not really using a lot right now, so this is important enough for me to sign my name on this piece of paper and go downtown and file, st file stamp, please, boom, so we know it's been filed, right? So redistricting occurs in every state after the release of the census data where state legislature, uh, where the state legislature redraws its congressional and state legislative districts. And again, multiple states are in litigation right now. At least as last I knew Alabama and certainly North Carolina is, uh, uh, is just resolving its, its matters. All right, so here is, 
you all are torturing me because I'm accustomed to interactive feedback and you all are looking at me. I'm just like, okay, am I doing okay? Am I falling on my face? Is this all right? Okay, so here is the summary and questions and it's how you know we're coming to a close now. All right, um, um, I have attempted to highlight for you in this discussion that religion and religious liberty has gone hand in hand with politics in America. When I use the term politics, I'm not at all talking about R versus D, blue versus red. I'm talking about citizen participation and people being moved by their conscience. Religion has certainly gone hand in hand and religious liberty has gone hand in hand with that. Religious liberty told some people to subjugate other people. And religious liberty also told some people to rise up from subjugation. The example I gave earlier uh, probably is apropos for this. The, 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 the Old Testament narrative of Exodus says rise up against circumstance. The New Testament narrative from Romans 13 that Jeff Sessions cited says be subjugated. Listen to those authorities. There are two competing schools of thought there. Religion and religious liberty has seen in America, we've seen both of those schools of thought manifest uh, uh, in the most pronounced ways. Religious leaders moved America for voting rights, while other religious factions have sought to maintain the status quo. We don't want you rising up. We don't want you exercising power. We want to maintain the power because this is the way it was in the beginning, and this is the way it shall be. Did you get that that was churchy? Did you catch that? Okay, anyway, my attempt at levity. All right, anyway, the Voting Rights Act of 1965 has been gutted, and it's been a full assault on democracy where Christian nationalism is being used to manipulate good people. There's nothing wrong with loving America. I love America. I'm a decorated veteran of the United States Army. I am a former infantry officer. For those that don't know what an infantryman is, you know what I like to tell them? I say, you saw the movie Forrest Gump? I was Lieutenant Dan, right? Okay, you can't tell me I don't love the United States of America. You can't tell me I'm an ordained minister. You can't tell me I don't love the Lord. But I have enough sense not to conflate the two to the exclusion of others. That's the problem with Christian nationalism. It is being used to manipulate good people. And the questions I'm asking you, which are not rhetorical, which is an invitation for audience participation, how can you be involved? What are you willing to do? That's my cue to shut up. <laughs> what are your questions? I want to engage you. I want to talk. I've attempted to provoke you. I don't expect you to agree with everything I've shared, but I'm hoping I provoke something where you want to you want to be heard. You want to let your voice be heard. And I hope we can have an intelligent conversation. Let's talk. Yes, sir. I probably use the term prophetic because I'm churchy, mm -hmm. but let me, so let me unpack the churchiness and make that in a, in a more secular context. Um, but let me stay with the churchiness for a moment because the example may make sense. In, uh, in, in ministry, in Christian ministry, you study uh, uh, what's called the Manus Triplex Doctrine. Some people call it the threefold office, meaning you look at Christian leaders as prophets, priests, or as kings. Ladies, forgive the gender reference, or as royals, as leading in the royal domain, right? So prophets, priests, or royals. The, the, the priest is the one who shows conciliatory leadership. The priest visits the hospital. The priest buries the dead. The, uh, uh, the king or the royal is the one who sets the church budget, who sets an agenda for the church to follow. This is the direction in which we're going with this campaign, with this stewardship campaign, with this Bible study series, et cetera, et cetera. But the prophet is the one and the one who exercises prophetic leadership is the one who stands on a moral authority, recognizing that certain systems are inherently unjust and somebody has got to speak truth to that institution of power to address those systems. So as a clergy person, I usually, I use the term pretty loosely prophetic or to speak prophetically, but, but hopefully that example makes sense. It's a, it's a moral conviction. Uh, when you think about, I, I had a slide in referencing Dr. Barber and I said, you know, social circumstances will give rise to prophetic leadership. Uh, uh, he really came to national prominence 
with the Moral Monday movement in North Carolina. Uh, his, his rise to prophetic leadership was in response to what the North Carolina General Assembly was doing, a broad range of things they were doing. That was just one that I highlighted with House Bill 589, just one. But he, 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 he repeatedly said, this is a moral issue. His engagement was far beyond clergy. His engagement was broad to laity, to people who agreed this is a moral issue. We're going to be involved. So my use of prophetic activism there is really to say, as in my vernacular, to speak truth to power, to be willing to stand up to it. Not necessarily as a clergy person, but as someone who's willing to call out unjust systems and to address them, excuse me, and to address them in any way you possibly can. Does that make sense? Let, let my people go. Yes. <laughs> Yes. And to put it in the context of what we're talking about, I've heard a sermon preached from Exodus. Let my people vote. Yes. Correct. And you get the tech. Yes. You can walk that dog down the street all different kind of ways. Correct. Absolutely. Correct. Any other comment? I must have bored you all to death. Was I that bad? Yes, sir. Please. Thank you. I have, I have a bias. I will, I will own it publicly. I have a bias because I'm in the church and I'm a leader of the church. So I believe that the church should be an exemplar for society at large. My bias does not say I, I uh, uh, um, negate the influence of those who care not to believe the same things I believe or care not to believe at all. So I think we all have a role to play. But I believe as a minister in the church, when I look at the church's proud history, when I look at the covenants and creeds that we've said, raised our hand for all these years, say we believe in these things, um, I think the church is supposed to lead the way because this is the way the church is supposed to lead. That's not to say others can't step up and lead, but as someone with my personal convictions, this is how I hope to lead. Um, um, the, very, the statement you made is so incredibly true, and that statement should scare all of you. That democracy could be a thing of the past in just a few years, and we could have absolute tyranny. Did you catch what I said there? Georgia's law says that uh, the state board can take over your local. Did you catch that? Yeah. Right. OK, we disagree with that. That's OK. Brush that aside. What? People voting, de Democratic participants. Are you kidding me? Democracy could very well be a thing of the past. If we, um, if we just slap on the wrist uh, January 6th protesters. I get pro, excuse me, let me not use that term protesters, insurrectionists, forgive me. I get protests. I get, I get this is unjust and I'm going to go be heard. And this is my, even during the George, uh, my, my mother used to say Bush too, even during W's administration, George W. Bush's administration, there were, there were protest zones, right? You couldn't go in the main stage. There was a, you know, go around the corner over here. This is your first amendment right to go protest. I would go participate in some of those spaces in the protest zones because I thought it was the right thing to do. But when you have no opportunity for your voice to be heard, that is scary to me. And that's not American. That's some of the stuff we're seeing on TV going on right now. Right. That's that's not American is what I'm saying. So it is it is for my money as a church leader. I hope to always lead in that regard. That's my self confession of my confession, if you will. But but my personal belief that the church should lead. I want to be clear in saying that it's not to the detriment of anyone else who may not believe what I believe stepping up and rising in leadership, too. But it's got to be a moral space. It must be a moral ground that you stand on. Yes, ma'am. Um, you think you could, would relate this kind of lack of response? Because it's since 2013. I'm a first year law school student. That was when I was in middle school. Do you think this lack of response has anything to do with that sort of idea of American exceptionalism and, oh, that's something that happens in other countries, not here? And kind of what, what steps and what areas do you see? So I think, I don't know, lack of response. Let me, let me address that for a moment. I think it depends on what you mean by response, right? Because the, the, if not the day after, certainly no more than two days after Shelby County was decided, the North Carolina General Assembly went to work. Let me be clear. They responded right away and saying, oh, ho, ho, the dogs are, the, the place is clear. Let's go to work, right? So, so state legislatures, I think, respond, in those covered jurisdictions, responded right away. I think the lack of citizen response oftentimes we get we get comfortable where we are right 
Um, I'm, I'm enjoying Dean Karen. I appreciate your comments on, isn't this great to just be around one another again, right? Isn't this wonderful to just be around one another? I, I serve a wonderful congregation, wonderful people, but sometimes people get comfortable. And for almost two years, pastor, we've been at home on the sofa in church in PJs. Preach, pastor, preach. But wait, when you coming back, when you come, oh, I send my ties. Wait a minute. What you want me to You want me to come physically? Are you kidding me? I'm comfortable. Right. OK. So so I think I think there are layers to that is the point I'm trying to make. Right. But I also think there's something to be said by as bad as things got. I don't mean to be chicken little, but 2020 seemed like, you know, the sky was falling almost as bad as things got. It really, really took things to get that bad to make people uncomfortable so they would be fully engaged in citizen participation again. Let me let me lift up on this on on to in response to your question. Also, one of the things I find incredibly encouraging about what we saw in the Black Lives Matter protest of 2020 is that there was not one race polarity. There was community. There were there were people of various races, ethnicities, uh, 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 various various generational, you know, intergenerational participation. The injustice that was going on uh, targeted at African Americans, uh, regrettably, uh, uh, specific cases. But the injustice that was pervasive, communities responded. Not just one group, communities responded, and that intergenerational, intercultural, interracial response to me was very encouraging because that lets me know hope is not lost. This is still America, and we can still be America if we're willing. Forgive me for paraphrasing. I want to quote, but if we're willing to move away from our embrace our angels and move away from our darker demons. I'm, par I'm butchering it, but I think you know the, the famous quote I'm making reference to. So, um, uh, so I think we are responding. It just took the bottom to fall out, so to speak, for us to respond. Yes, sir. How, in your opinion, do we reorient society away from the divisive space that we've developed toward the more inclusive society? Because we have taken many aspects of everyday life and turned it into sports. We've said, well, I'm part of the Republican team, so that means I have to fall in line with everything that they say. Or I'm part of the Democratic team, I have to fall in line with everything they say because that's the team I support. Yeah. Instead of taking a more pragmatic approach and approaching things on individual topics. Yeah, I, I could not agree with you more in terms of the obvious philosophy that, that provokes the question. In, uh, in the book, Call to Reconciliation, forgive this shameless promotional, right? In the book, Call to Reconciliation, um, it, is a, it is a book not just about Christianity, not just about church, but it's really about, about the team politics, the polarization that you reference. And, um, and, and if there's anything I'm optimistic about with respect to uh, uh, the 45th president is that his personal transgressions caused so many who would have been on the team and looking particularly at evangelical voters who were such a predictable voting block for his party for so long. I think several of them, several groups, not just several individuals, several groups, several leading evangelical authors have said, wait, 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 wait. It's not what I signed up for. You, this is out of control. Wait a minute. Wait, somebody stop this fire, right? So I think people are reassessing this polarity and this us versus them, this teamism, if you will, that we've embraced. Um, I shared in the last lecture something I'm very proud of. If you if you care to Google Center for Pastor Theologians, um, it is a it is a very right of center group, uh, 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 probably more mainline white evangelicals. Uh, but because they are they are responding in the same spirit to which you asked the question to the to the problem of this polarization in America, they've said been very deliberate in saying we want to hear some from some other voices we may not otherwise hear from. So I've got an invitation and I'm going to be participating in their um, October 2022 convention in Chicago in a breakout session leading discussion, and I'm a reconciliation person, so I'm going to talk about trying to bring people together in spite of, and I think the bottom falling out has maybe given the impetus for us to all wake up and say, wait, 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 this is not what we signed up for. How can we draw people together instead of, instead of focusing on this, this polarization and bringing people apart? So I'm, I'm, op I'm optimistic that the, that the country, that individuals, that groups will start moving in that direction and that the shit will start to turn just because of the chaos that we've had. Yes, sir. A um, couple of things. <clears throat> Revelation 13 counters Romans 13. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. The Roman Empire is seen as a monster. Absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, so it's, it's, it's not one story there. 
second thing is we're seeing right now in Russia conflation of religion and politics of the worst kind. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Though we sit in, in, our, in our country too, as you said. But you know, it's, it's not new. It's the history of, of Christianity trying to learn how to separate itself not conflating, but still participating. And uh, uh, religious liberty and separation of church and state does not mean that we do not participate. It simply means that we don't try to dominate right. for everybody else. Right. Is, is that the way you read it? I, I see that as a fair comment. Um, let me say, you, you really are provocative with Revelation. Uh, Revelation, I know this is the law school, not the school of theology, so let me just briefly, the book ends, I know you got the book last night, you had, the book ends with a reference to um, Revelation 7 in the, in the church triumphant, in the, in the distinction the church militant and how God envisions diversity for all of us, for all human beings with a, with a, a concept of gumbo instead of, instead of a melting pot, right? Um, but for those who don't know, Revelation is written as what I would call prophetic literature, by John, who's now in isolation on the island of Patmos, a penal colony, because he's been following his religious convictions, and the, and the dominant authorities say, no, 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 you and that Christian stuff, you got to go, we're going we're gonna to send you out to pasture. So he writes a critique against the Roman Empire, against the powers that be. So to your point, absolutely, so I agree with you 110%. Um, we have seen a dangerous conflation in Russia. Uh, Vladimir Putin, I think the, the quote I saw last night was, is the butcher, right? So I, he's a... He's a I'm going to leave reservation or leave comment on that. Um, it, is, it is dangerous. We've seen it's predictable in many regards where we see a pendulum swing from democratic regimes to totalitarianism to, to anything but democracy. And that's exactly what we're seeing now in Russia. Um, it, is, it is incredibly regrettable because we also are seeing a connection with certain segments and political segments in the United States and a link with Russia that I think is most troubling and perhaps an inaction on behalf of many to speak out against that link because they don't want to get, can I use this verb, primaried. Am I making sense, right? Because there's an underlying, they don't want an opponent in the primary. They don't want, they don't want somebody to rise up against them and in in a, in somebody who's feared to be popular, who may be very close with Putin, to, uh, to endorse their opponent. Am I making sense now? You follow what I'm saying? So, but I, I do, I hear you 110%. I do hear you 110%. I think that's a very fair comment. Any other comments or questions? Did I put you all to sleep? No dose. V v vibrant. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. And as we were sitting there talking, I, I turned to one of my friends who had his laptop up and I said, um, I want you to copy and paste a paragraph of that bill and give it to him. And he did. And we saw the same way in which was being introduced in legislation across the country. So that means this is orchestrated. It's not isolated. It's orchestrated. Critical race theory. Right, right. I mean, and the fact that so many people can't admit that America is so racist that, that if you speak 
out against racism, people think you're being unpatriotic. And I'm so glad you're optimistic. <laughs> I, I'm so glad, um, particularly since you know you you study this more than than I do, but and you manage to maintain your optimism. But but I get concerned right now with just um, just how a person who had a pornographer's sentence to the lowest common denominator was able to lead our country for 40 years and figure out how to marshal the, the worst parts of our nature so effectively. And how to basically, um, how to basically turn the majority of a political party that has some really great people in it and has done some really great things but who now have to be scared about being primary if they say something that can be perceived as unpatriotic. And hopefully, <laughs> hope, no, I appreciate the comment. Hopefully the pendulum will swing in the opposite direction. Hopefully it will. Hopefully we can be better than we appear to be right now. But being better starts with spaces like this, which is why I'm so grateful for BJC's leadership um, in having honest conversations where I do not expect everything I've said for you to agree with, but I would hope that you can listen, hopefully embrace, and hopefully say, okay, I'm empathic enough to see this is his perspective. It may not be my perspective, but hopefully me sharing what I've shared has infused some different school of thought enough as to where you can walk away and disagree without being disagreeable. But when we reach a space where, when we disagree as a nation, when we disagree on the outcome of an election, we're just gonna take it over. Martial rule, that's a problem. That means democracy is gone. That means we're no different than other countries that we profess to be better than under this manifest destiny. <laughs> that means we're absolutely no different whatsoever. So, but your comment is greatly appreciated though. Yes, sir. Uh, it's not a challenge uh, as much as uh, I agree with Dave that your optimism is uh, good. Uh, but I, but I, I, I think the layers are, are sort of deeper, uh, mm -hmm. and, uh, and we have a hard time addressing them in ways that are beyond the presidential level. Mm -hmm. uh, so elections matter, but they matter all the way down. Absolutely. Right. That are not well attended or not voted. And I, I do think that you can, that people can mobilize CRT for political purposes. But I was teaching a student uh, who was a freshman last year at Mercer uh, who is from Arkansas. She's a stamp scholar from Arkansas. So she's the brightest, she's it. Like she's, and she is really great and gifted intellectually. And I talked about the Elaine Massacre. And she stopped me after class and she said, why has no one ever talked about this? She said, I've had, I've had four years of Arkansas history. I, there was a massacre in Elaine? Yeah. And so this, I like, I'm actually impressed by your optimism about churches. You use church throughout the talk as if it's a collective, right? When white congregations really don't like these conversations. I think Regardless it depends. Of, well, I, well. Because just like, but, 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 and I don't mean to interrupt you, but I just. I understand, I, but it's, it, 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 and you're gonna go to one of them in a minute. Mm -hmm. <laughs> reconciliation conversation, mm -hmm. and people say, would you please stop talking about that? This is the progressive church, right, that is uncomfortable with, a, so it's your, I, I think I'm, I'm 
applauding your comfort idea. Thank you. We, we get into a comfortable space and it's hard to change it. But, but that level, the layers are so deep that we that unpacking them is going to take a lot of work. Yeah. Uh, and so it's an affirmation that I like your, your positiveness, uh, but um, it takes a lot of work. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you very much. To your point about the Elaine massacre, that, that incident of someone who's a native of the state not knowing is not isolated. No. Um, right. Certainly in North Carolina, there's a, there's a rich history in Wilmington uh, for a takeover. Uh, with regard to Tulsa, I have a very dear friend who now pastors in Baltimore, uh, but he pastored the only edifice to survive the Tulsa race massacre of 1921. Uh, most people didn't know anything about that until the 100th anniversary of the massacre. Uh, as someone from Louisiana, I recognize that an insurrection against the government is not new just because you don't like the, the, the results of, a, of an election. Colfax, Louisiana, something very similar to what you saw on January 6, 2021, 1872, if I'm not mistaken, exact same dynamic, exact, exact same dynamic. So um, history will repeat itself, but if you, if you remove the books from the library and nobody's there to know about them, my goodness gracious, that this didn't happen, who made that up? You must be making that up, right? That's why this whole power grab is so dangerous. That's why this rhetoric of critical race theory is so dangerous. That's why uh, you reference school boards. That goes to my heart because I served as a publicly elected school board member uh, for four years, three and a half years. I resigned to go to seminary because the Lord, I was a lawyer practicing. I say was as if I lost my bar card. I'm still a lawyer. I'm just not going to court every day, right? I'm still a lawyer. But at any rate, but, uh, but, uh, but, but school boards, local elections matter equally as much as presidential elections because the ramifications are closer to home, right? I think they matter just as much or arguably more. Um, but yeah, we have to fight for democracy and democracy is part of information access. We're not democratic if we say we're gonna limit access to information. Why would we take books out of libraries? Why would we ban discussions? That's like if, if this is obviously hypothetical and made up, but that's if I start talking about devil worshiping and how it's good for you, you, you I mean, okay, that's the marketplace of ideas. I'm not going to have that conversation, obviously, but if I am saying that kind of stuff, that's the marketplace of ideas. It's up to you to reject that and say, okay, he's a nut, or it's up to you to say, hey, that's wonderful. I want to do that too, right? Which is why I think we were able to elect who we elected in 2016 because he is, he is he's crafty, as they would say. He's crafty. He's savvy, he's clever, he understood political operation, and um, that's an expression I use in tort class, the, the marketplace of ideas. When people say, well, what about defamation? They said this, they said that. Can't you sue for defamation? It's in the public domain. It's free speech in the marketplace of ideas. It's up to the people, the consumer, to determine truth and separate it once it's in the marketplace of ideas. But, uh, but when you limit that marketplace to it's only one thing, that's not democratic. That's, that's, you know, that's something else. <laughs> that's something else. Thank you very much for the comment, and I'm looking forward to the visit to the church. I am, I am. I am. Dr. Armstrong, yes, ma'am. have a group here in Macon called Georgia Women, mm -hmm. and it tries to make women, or whoever wants to join, alert as to what bills are coming out before the state legislature, mm -hmm. so you can call your representative, mm -hmm. your senator, and say, please vote this way or that way. The other day we had a lunch and learn on this Georgia law that's voting law that just passed and we had the deputy secretary of state and we got to ask some questions and i said did we have a lot of fraud in georgia that we had to have this voting law and he said we don't have any any information on that exhibit a and we didn't orchestrate this we didn't plan that response beforehand right exhibit a said the lawyer right but as part of hence my comments about people not wanting to get primary, people not wanting to draw attention to themselves from somebody else coming in. You're against America. You're against God. How dare you not? We got to protect this country. We need these laws. That's, that's smoke, mirrors, and everything else. And everything else. Just like, again, I'm here to share with you. I went to the same law school as your dean. I studied critical race theory in law school. Anybody talking about it at the elementary school level, at the middle school level, at the high, it does not happen. You heard it here from somebody who knows it does not happen, but that does not mean it will not be used as such a wedge dividing issue as to bring it up in Supreme Court confirmation hearings and say, well, let's have this, but well, that's a private school it doesn't happen there. But I got my script and my talking points and I'm sticking to it because the cameras are rolling right now. So I'm going to talk about critical. I'm like, what is she? So what? It's America. 
It's America. It's America. Thank you for sharing that, though. Any other comment to me? I don't want to hold you from a good meal or a good beverage, nice. What time is it here, okay? Okay, thank you all so very much. It's really been a pleasure. Thank you so much for your hospitality, too.